Welcome to uh, this uh, Friday afternoon, June the 5th, for the uh, media update and announcements from our uh, other levels of government. I'm uh, happy to say the federal government announced today a contribution of some $14 billion to support a safe economic restart. That funding will go in part to supporting cities and the frontline services we provide to residents, such as uh, public transit and community programs. This funding is also being provided to support and enhance the uh, costs for personal protective equipment for frontline healthcare workers and for ensuring that businesses have adequate uh, PPEs when they restart and transition back to work as well. Also, additional uh, support for childcare and immediate assistance to vulnerable people, including seniors, and, uh, and the previously announced support for the 10 day sick leave for workers. So this is the uh, federal government's clearest commitment to date to uh, work with the provinces to solve our municipal financial crisis. I would say it's not all the money that we're asking for and we're certainly concerned about uh, how that money flows and how quickly and whether or not it gets uh, caught up in jurisdictional issues. But we're hoping that uh, both our federal and provincial governments can sort that out and push these, uh, these dollars out uh, quickly and directly and uh, help support uh, uh, our cities nationwide and uh, that in turn will help support our cities uh, and, and our overall economic recovery. The, uh, the one-time one benefit top-up for seniors payment will begin to be issued the uh, week of July the 6th. Among these impacted the most by COVID-19 have been seniors. So here in Hamilton, there are over 167,000 people of, over the age of 60, or 55, 30% of which uh, is, uh, it's 30% of our population. So through this measure and others, the government is providing nearly $900 more for single seniors and more than $1,500 for couples on, on top of their existing benefits to help those vulnerable people with their extra costs during this pandemic. And some good news uh, from the federal government as well. New modeling projections show that Canada is making progress in the fight against COVID-19. Data is showing a lower number of cases in many communities and significantly health officials have been able to trace where these cases originated. Uh, and that's certainly an encouraging sign that uh, this virus is, seems to be slowing down. And although this is good news on a, on a national basis, uh, remember we're not out of the woods yet and uh, Ontario may be in somewhat of a different situation uh, locally. And uh, I'm sure Dr. Richardson will share some uh, additional COVID-19 numbers with you shortly. Yesterday, the uh, Mayor's Task Force on Economic Recovery held its first meeting. Uh, it, uh, it was a diverse group uh, that is reflecting on the, the, uh, the very important work of getting our uh, economy back up and going and getting our employment numbers back up. Uh, participating in all of this are our three chambers of commerce, our business, business improvement areas, representation from the hospitality, restaurant, entertainment sectors, as well as uh, our academic and not-for-profit uh, communities, all of them uh, significant employers in our community and all of which uh, will help in terms of our economic recovery going forward. So we're hoping for some uh, action-driven plans that uh, will help us on the immediate uh, uh, startup uh, when we're allowed to do that. And at the same time, time, look at the positioning of the city of Helmand for long-term sustainable economic recovery. So lots of work to be done there, lots of people putting their shoulder to the wheel. I'm very grateful that uh, Ron McCurley, the president of Mohawk College, has uh, agreed to be a chair and uh, 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 and the vice chair, his name escapes me right at the moment, uh, Terry Johns, uh, who represents the uh, West End Home Builders Association, will be the vice chair. And there's lots of good people here that uh, will certainly make some good recommendations on what we either need to, need to do as a city or what we need to advocate for on behalf of other levels of government that will help uh, speed up the, uh, the recovery and employment in our community. The further, further help to support our local uh, small businesses, the city has been selected as one of eight municipalities to participate in the Shop Here, powered by Google program. The program helps independent businesses and artists set up online stores to help minimize the economic impacts of COVID-19. The goal in Hamilton is to help 200 businesses and artists gain the skills they need to build their own online store. And being one of only eight Canadian municipalities selected for this program, it highlights the robust entrepreneurial spirit we have in our community and uh, a commitment to supporting uh, each other as much as we can. So uh, thank you to uh, 
shop here powered by Google, a, a great program, and hopefully uh, many small businesses and artists can apply for this free uh, program by visiting uh, shophere.hamiltonbusinesscenter.ca. Uh, so please share that with the city of Hamilton's uh, funding application for social service providers and community organizations. Uh, they have provided almost $37,500 to local community organizations to support them in the delivery of their services during the COVID-19 pandemic. So keeping six and ham smart, Hamilton Habitat for Humanity, the Salvation Army Loss and Ministry Hamilton, Global Citizens Care for Underprivileged and Refuge Empowerment, Refugee Empowerment, I should say, and Hamilton and District Senior Citizens Home, Inc., NCNIB. They, uh, each of these organizations, thank each of these organizations for continuing to safely operate and assist those in our community during this uh, pandemic. Uh, lots of organizations are functioning and operating to help provide services in our community. I just listed a collection of them that uh, are doing a terrific job of doing just that. I'm gonna turn it over to our Emergency Operations Center uh, Manager now, Paul Johnson, for some uh, news from that sector. Paul. Thanks very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this week, of course, uh, we continue to monitor all the activities that are going on in the city. And really we are in the mode of waiting for the next series of announcements and the provincial government uh, indicated today that uh, there is more announcements coming next week about how other businesses and in particular childcare uh, may be given some guidance, a particular guidance about how to reopen safely. And this is uh, very, um, important for us to understand how our community is going to function moving forward uh, as the province releases uh, some of their plans for the reopening of the economy and other parts of our community. So we are doing the behind the scenes work. We don't have any announcements today about that. We don't have those guidelines out there, but our folks have been working hard. And I want to thank um, uh, all of our staff internally who are working with their organizations, both provincially, uh, as well as uh, their colleagues in other municipalities to really ensure that we're able to move rather swiftly. Some of the challenges are that uh, when announcements are made, uh, the expectations of the public are that almost immediately those services come online. So as much as we can be prepared, uh, we will be. Uh, that goes for some of the other amenities that uh, I know people are interested in as we get closer and closer towards the summer. Uh, we're doing some of the work behind the scenes so that we can be ready for those activities uh, should that uh, those announcements come. So that uh, it tends to be a bit of our, our direction at the moment. I do want to uh, remind the public that uh, with this warm weather up upon us, uh, public beaches are still closed under provincial order. We'll see what uh, happens with that next week, but as of now, those are closed. Uh, so lots of other amenities available and the parks and our trails and 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 those uh, some of our conservation areas and things like that but uh, the public beaches uh, remain closed at this particular moment uh, some of the things that uh, people may see in the next few days we have been working with uh, our our um, professional sports organizations that call Tim Hortons Field Home, uh, both the Forge uh, playing uh, soccer uh, or football, the, the, the round ball kind of football, and our Ticats uh, who play the other kind of football. And they are working, of course, with their professional leagues and the provincial and federal guidelines around how to return to training. And we have been supporting that. Uh, that is something that's happening through their leagues. And why I mention that is uh, you may see some of that training begin in the coming days as, uh, as we have um, provided our support to their work provincially uh, and nationally to get to their, their return to training programs in place. But that has led to other questions uh, from amateur sports groups who say, well, can we bring a few of our players from our summer soccer league or our baseball or t-ball team? Can we come and practice a bit on some of the field because we see the pros doing it. And the answer to that is no. Our sports fields are open, uh, but they are not uh, there for team activities and organized activities, even if that is small groups of people coming together to uh, quote unquote train. The sports fields and other places are available for people to go out and enjoy uh, the parks um, uh, as, as friends or as family and uh, kick the ball around uh, a little bit or, or play catch or something like that. But it is not there for any level of organized activity, uh, not just uh, not for games, but also for the training. So if coaches are out there or leagues are out there thinking, well, I'll just bring a few people along for some training and activities, that's uh, an organized activity and our sports fields are not available for that. And, uh, and that's um, 
across the province. That's not just a city of Hamilton thing. So we're still waiting for that. Um, as we, you do know, some sports have started up, things like golf, things like uh, uh, things like uh, uh, tennis, uh, and in fact, figure skating uh, is available as an activity uh, through its sport association. But uh, the team sports are still being uh, considered provincially, and uh, so there's no announcements on that. And please just use our sports fields as individuals and families at this stage, and uh, you'll avoid any trouble with our bylaw folks uh, on that front as well. So as we uh, anticipate next week, some more announcements coming, we'll be able to, to adapt to that and uh, we'll have more announcements coming next week on that front as well. And my, my last comment is, uh, you know, last week we, we talked a lot about what wasn't, was, wasn't going to be happening in recreation uh, this summer in terms of us not running our, our usual summer camp programs and our, our not hiring our students to run our, our usual soupy program. Uh, but I am really impressed by the work that's happened as we announced last week and, and you saw some of the work that we're anticipating we'll be able to do in the summer uh, once the province releases some of the, the orders, uh, when and if that happens, we'll be able to provide a few more uh, activities, including you know, some kits that people can take home so that they can enjoy recreation as a family in their own home environment with some really great tools from, uh, from our experts in that field and recreation. But the other side is we are uh, very much looking forward to and hoping that we'll be able to provide some uh, programming to both adults and, and families uh, in our parks uh, as part of a modified approach to, to getting people to recreate uh, on their own or as a family this coming summer. And so to our recreation staff who of course are going to see a very, very different summer in terms of their work with the community. Uh, my hat's off to them for, for having the creativity to look at some activities that uh, we hope to announce uh, more fully uh, once we uh, see some, some changes at the provincial level, which will allow us to move forward in July and August with those ideas. Now over to uh, Dr. Richardson. Thanks very much, Paul. And I'm going to go through, give you a bit of a case update, and that's where it's going to mostly focus today. So. We're at 734 cases as of nine o'clock this morning. Um, that's uh, 727 lab confirmed and seven probable. The concern here is that's an increase of 19 new cases from yesterday. And so we've been talking this past week about um, where we've been sitting at, you know, some increases of 12, and now we have an increase of 19 today. So I'm going to come back to that in just a minute after we just go over um, a few other of the details. The good news is that 75% of the cases are resolved, and um, that's been going up steadily in terms of the proportion as we've been moving through this outbreak. So that's a good sign in terms of how things are evolving. There have been 40 deaths to date with no new deaths um, to be reported today. We are down to one institutional outbreak. Again, good news um, in terms of the progress of this, that uh, outbreak continues at Hamilton General Hospital on their COVID-19 unit. We had uh, the uh, outbreak at Aberdeen Gardens declared over as of yesterday. And of course we have no community outbreak still. So very good news um, on that front. Uh, we did launch a new section on the public health section of the COVID-19 website focused on workplace and public place settings to provide some guidance around workplaces that are opened or opening, as well as advice on how the community can take precautions when they're in those public places. So take a look at www.hamilton.ca slash coronavirus for that uh, new information. So just coming back to that 19 new cases today. So you know that's one of the, the numbers that we're monitoring in terms of how we're doing, telling us in terms of, you know, following the general direction around um, increased hand washing, so the physical distancing that we talk about, staying home when you're sick, all those sorts of things. And we've been looking at, you know, is there any particular pattern? And you've heard discussion about hot spots and that sort of thing. And uh, and we're looking for those sorts of things all the time, as we talked about um, in, our, in our analysis. Um, so what we see in common amongst the cases of late is that um, they tend to be concentrated in the 20 to 20 to 29 year old age group and um, really even in the, the first half of that, that group. And so it shows that they seem to be having challenges consistently applying those preventive measures, the physical distancing, wearing of face coverings if you're gonna not be able to physical distance, um, uh, practicing really good hygiene, you know, coughing into sleeves, all of those sorts of things. Um, when they're commuting to work, when they're in social and recreational environments, um, 
and you know especially around that piece about physical distancing the mask and uh and the hand sanitizer hand washing those sorts of things so um it's really important that if people have a COVID infection and that they're living in a roommate situation or something where they're, they're living together with other people that they are as well taking uh, precautions to isolate within the house so that ideally they have their own bathroom. Um, but if they're not able to do that, wearing a mask when they're in the house and we do give them surgical masks to wear in those kinds of settings that have that higher level of protection and, uh, and following through on all um, all of our recommendations. So overall, we have about 19% of our cases um, are in that 20 to 29 year old age group. But in the last 10 days, it's been 43% of our, of our cases have been in that age group. So that's a significant shift. We know, you know, we know as younger, uh, older adolescents and younger adults, they tend to be in a sort of stage of life where they're a little bit more you know, maybe risk taking, maybe not, uh, they're, they're trying on different things, they're very social. And so we know that a lot of these messages can be difficult to, um, to take up and to follow. And so we're going to be targeting a, a particular social media campaign over the next week to that's, uh, that's looking at messages that are relevant to this group to try and get that message out. There's not a single workplace. There's really no other thing that defines this, this sort of pattern that we're seeing other than sort of age and stage of life. And so it's not, there's not an occupational outbreak or something like that, um, but it's really uh, that age group. So that's it from me for today. I'm going to turn it back to you, Mr. Mayor. As I should, I should turn my microphone on. Thank you. Thank you for those updates. And, uh, you know, particularly concerning when young people, and we were all young once and thought we were uh, impervious and immune and could conquer anything. Unfortunately, uh, young people also connect with parents and grandparents. And so uh, the spread of this could lead to people that uh, could be more seriously impacted by this uh, virus. So certainly a concerning increase in that age group is, uh, something we need to stay on top of. So thank you for that. Uh, I do want to do a quick shout out to the following organizations who are going above and beyond during the pandemic. Uh, right now, it's the Ancaster Community Services. They are providing nutritious food for low-income seniors, especially during this pandemic. That's why the Ancaster Community Services is offering three free frozen meals per month to qualifying seniors. So for more information on that, call 905-648 six six seven five or email ancaster community services at gmail.com and uh, congratulations to melanie barlow and her team at the ancaster community services for that good work I'm sure there's many in our community that are going to get benefit from that and a shout out to uh, sobe's supermarket in flamborough uh, they've donated a thousand in sobe's gift cards uh, to the food with grace water down food bank which operates out of the grace anglican church uh, thank you to uh, Troy Gancy and his entire team at Sobeys in Flamborough. And again, uh, you know, many, many people in our community uh, and many, many organizations in stores and retail outlets are doing extraordinary things to help uh, people through this uh, crisis that we're still in the middle of and uh, not yet out of. And so uh, thank you for all that great work. And I'm going to turn it back to Jasmine to uh, field some media questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll start with Lisa Paleski from CHML. Lisa, you can go ahead. Hi, thanks very much for taking my questions. Um, I just had a question for Director Paul Johnson about uh, waterfall enforcement. There's been some concern um, about the citizens in Greensville who have been saying that, you know, despite all the messaging from the city that the waterfalls are closed, there's just, it seems like, people are still trespassing and that no, nothing's really being done. So just wanted to pass that on and ask uh, what kind of enforcement um, is in that area. So it is a priority area of enforcement and, and I, um, I certainly understand for those who are there at the best of times, uh, there are challenges, uh, the balancing those who wish to go to the waterfalls and, and those who, who call those areas of our, our city home. So I, I know it's a challenge and an ongoing one in COVID, it's become even more uh, challenging. Uh, we do know that an awful lot of people are coming from out of town uh, there, and, and although they, they should still realize, and there's certainly lots of good signage, um, sometimes, of course, they're not reading the local media, they're not picking up the local messages. 
Uh, the last thing is uh, we did uh, uh, tackle um, a parking lot that was becoming an issue. I think I gave that update about a week ago um, uh, that, that helped, I think, Johnson to park. Um, we closed that parking lot, which meant that no one can go and use the park, which is open, but it also meant that kind of curtails people from going to an area to look at the falls. So it is a hotspot uh, area that we know our falls are. Uh, we do proactive enforcement. It's certainly where we would deploy more of our resources on a regular basis. But uh, as I've said often, uh, you know, from uh, the standpoint of our, our person power on the ground, uh, it's tough to cover uh, as much uh, area as Hamilton has. And, you know, as the weather gets better and better, uh, more people are trying to get out and do things. So we continue to, to make those efforts and encourage the public continue to phone in if you, if you feel there's things that we need to tackle. Uh, those phone calls to 546 City will allow us to uh, to know that there's something going on and, and uh, prioritize that. And, and if uh, people feel we're just not there enough, know that we are out and we're doing our best to, to tackle a number of these places. And you've heard me talk about Albion Falls. Uh, and, uh, Shadoak Falls is becoming more of a, of a hotspot in terms of our enforcement areas as well. So we're seeing a growing number of that and we're trying to get to as many of them as we can. Okay, thank you. And um, for the follow-up, I was just wanted to ask Dr. Richardson about the uh, the new cases that we've seen, um, the 19 new cases, which it's all kind of younger people. Is the, is Hamilton unique in that respect, or do you have any other information on how we compare to other areas? So I don't. We don't at this stage. Oh. I got it off properly. Uh, we don't at this stage have a, uh, a breakdown of cases by age on the sort of decade by decade level. Um, it tends to be just more in terms of that vulnerable uh, older adult age group. And so um, we're just looking at doing some comparisons uh, across groups um, and we'll see what, what information we can get from the province in that regard. Um, you know, we do hear of, of sort of different patterns in different areas. For example, we know some areas have a lot of workplace-based outbreaks. We don't have that. Um, we happen to have this, this piece of it. So we keep reaching out and, and looking at the uh, epidemiology amongst different par parts of Ontario, and uh, we have yet to see exactly what uh, they look like on that front. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Richardson. Next question will be from uh, Samantha Craigs from CBC Hamilton. Samantha, you can go ahead. Hi there. Uh, my question is for Dr. Richardson, my first one. Um, you mentioned the the age group, and uh, we we do know um, there was a rally, for example, in in Gore Park last weekend, and uh, some people getting together and and demonstrating. Um, are there any cases linked to that? That, thanks, Sam. No, there hasn't been any link back to that particular event. Um, it, this is this really does seem to be more around commuting and social and recreational sort of activities and not maintaining physical distancing and practicing good hygiene. Um, we will still look, of course, you know, we've got that 14 day period after that event. We'll continue to look and see if any of the cases do appear to be related to that. We wouldn't be completely past that time frame at this point. But uh, no, these ones don't relate to that at all. So what I what I take from um, what you were saying about um, you know pe people in their twenties um, more testing po are they just it, it almost sounds like you're saying that there are people hanging out with their friends when maybe they shouldn't be um, and they're thinking you know I've been cooped up for a long time it's okay I'm young I'm healthy um, is that your sense of what's going on? Yeah, I think the sense would be that we've got, you know, a group of people who, you know, are at an age and stage in life where there tends to be less of that sort of, you know, thinking about how um, these sorts of risks can affect them and they may be seeing that they're experiencing a milder illness than some people who are at higher risk, although we know anybody at any age ultimately can be at risk for more severe disease. And, you know, being very social and it is hard. It's hard for all of us in terms of seeing family, friends and those sorts of things. And, uh, and so our sense is they're, they aren't following the social distancing, the, sorry, the physical distancing rules with their social groups um, and not pack, practicing the best preventive measures. And so we're really hoping to underscore that with this group, really have them understand that they are vulnerable to this illness personally and, uh, and they can get something that's more severe than perhaps they've, they've seen or experienced um, if others have, have had it. And of course, as the, the mayor's already pointed out, they, they go home to parents, grandparents, uh, people with medical conditions that uh, they may or may not know about that they can also transmit it and, and they could go on to become very, very ill. And so, 
you know, we're going to be focusing our campaign on, on trying to reach that group and trying to, to uh, sort of understand where they're coming from and help them to understand the perspective and, and what the risks are. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Richardson. Next question will be from Dale from CHCH. Dale, you can go ahead. Uh, thank you. This is, uh, again, about the new demographics of 20 to 29-year-olds. Uh, Dr. Richardson, you mentioned the 43%. Is that 43% of all new cases, and how far back does that statistic go? So we always like to look, and I, I just wanted to make sure, Dale, that you had it as the 20 to 29. I wasn't sure if you said 28 Correct. to 29. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure it's not that narrow a band. Um, and indeed, it's actually the younger side of the 20 to 29 group. And so what we do, because we know that on any given day, you know, we are still dealing with a relatively small number of cases on any given day. And so you may see something for one day or for two days, but we want to see what the trends are over longer term. So we look at the cases as a whole, all of our 734, but then we focus in on what's been happening in the last 10 days to see if we're seeing any new trends. And so, as I said, when we look at the cases as a whole, they constitute a smaller proportion. But when we look at the last 10 days, they make up 43% of our cases. And so that's definitely been a shift um, as we've gone forward. So that is the more recent cases that have, have been focused in that 20 to 29 year old age group. Okay, thank you for clarifying. And again, uh, the next question is either for uh, you again, Dr. Richardson or the mayor or both. Um, what are the early discussions of what uh, the reopening of eat-in restaurants will look like and the public health advice of how they should approach reopening? Do you want me to lead that off, folks? Uh, yes. So um, it will ultimately, you know, be the provincial decisions in terms of when any of those reopen. Uh, there is guidance that is already out there in terms of all the different workplaces from the standpoint of how um, they can reopen from the standpoint of worker safety and providing uh, safety for their clients. In terms of specific guidance, um, these are restaurants that were functioning well, and they will be able, they will be able to reopen as they go forward without us having to clear them or anything like that. But we are looking at get, at developing a little bit more guidance for them around what to do, and hence you'll start to see, you know, more guidance on our website around what people can do. We're very mindful in restaurants; they're in a bit of a tough spot, right? The nature of of their work of the of the business they offer is that people sit close together within that six foot rule. They uh, bring people together, and they have people coming to serve them personally and so you know looking at things if you go back to that reopening discussion that we had last week and the factors that can help make things better you know having places that are wider open having fewer uh, people concentrated together not as long contact time those are tough for them but that's where you've seen pieces like looking at, could we do more outdoor dining so that people are out, we have good ventilation, we get the benefits of UV light because most people are gonna be wanna be out in the sunshine as opposed to out in the rain. And, uh, and looking at some ways we can encourage circumstances where people might be able to do that um, in a way that is safer, that reduces those risks. So we're still going through trying to give advice on those, uh, on those areas. We know that our uh, economic development folks, Jason Thorne and, and all those folks are looking at ways they can help and support that. And, uh, and council's been looking at that as well. So we don't have anything more specific at this point, but that's, uh, it is one of the trickier businesses to get up and running again. Thanks, Dr. Richardson. Next question for Katrina Clark from the Hamilton Spectator. Katrina, you can go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Dr. Richardson. I just wanted to check in and see what uh, the requirements are surrounding who can qualify to get tested for COVID right now. Is it anyone who can get tested or are there certain restrictions? So basically at this point around the testing guidance, you know, there's anybody can get tested. If they have a concern that they've been exposed, if they've got a concern that, um, you know, they their work brings them into contact with people with COVID-19, um, anybody can get tested. What Who we most want to see get tested are people who have symptoms consistent with COVID-19. So, and that symptom list is pretty broad now. We really want to see them soon and we want to see them within 24 hours because we know that that group are the group that are most likely to spread 
COVID-19 along with anybody else who's been infected um, and hasn't yet shown symptoms. So that's why the contact tracing part of that is also so important. And we're following up with tests and following those people really frequently. So that's a, a lot of focus for us is on that piece about trying to limit transmission. We're of course wanting to look at any outbreaks in any sort of congregate setting and making sure we're doing testing around those. And then we know that the government is also looking at some targeted testing that they're doing going forward. Long-term care homes again is one of the groups that they're looking at. So absolutely, you know, testing is available. I do know for our assessment centers today, they have gone over the top in terms of the number of people that are coming through and walk in. And so we're, you know, really wanting to underscore again, the booking is really important to make sure that we have good flow through and we can make sure we see everybody in a day. And we're looking along with Ontario West to Ontario Health West to look at, you know, what could we do to, uh, to increase the number of people who can be seen and to help support that testing strategy as OH Ontario Health uh, developed it more fully. So it is available. We are starting to experience pretty high volumes at our assessment centers. The booking is really critical. And, uh, and we know this is just part of, of ramping it, it up as we go. Thank you. And then um, my follow up question, I'm wondering when the city or public health is planning to release a map that would show uh, the hotspots throughout the city? Catrice, that's uh, the, the map question I'm happy to say is in development. We're just finishing refining it. It's a little it's a little tricky to get all the information on one map and make sure it's interpretable. So we've been working on that this week and um, looking to get that up. I'm hopeful, fingers crossed, that we'll have it for you next week. Um, I would say, I, I'm just going to come back to your point about hotspots. We've looked at that I, um, thoroughly, and of course you want to see it for yourself and see if there's anything more, and we know that, and we want to get that out, up there on the web. We haven't seen anything geographically in terms of hotspots. Um, we don't see a tight correlation either in terms of, uh, we're in terms of seeing the number of positives in areas of the city that have lower income, unlike what Toronto saw when they did their maps. Um, our particular areas, as you've heard me talk about, in terms of, of places that have higher rates, have been, you know, in the past, those, those long-term care homes that had the outbreaks. And when we went in and did the testing and, and saw that there were usually only a small number of cases um, in those areas, but one, you know, a couple of the of the long-term care homes and retirement homes had those larger outbreaks that contributed a significant number of cases. Um, the second piece has been amongst families and uh, spread in families or family-like settings. As I said, the roommate situation, but people who are living together, it, it really, we've heard us say all along that this, this virus spreads the best when it's got, you know, frequent long contact between people. That's when it spreads easily. Uh, if you don't have any other measures put in place. So those settings are, are where we also see our hotspots. And then the one that's just been evolving over the last week to 10 days is this one amongst um, people who are in that 20 to 29 year old age group. And they are where we're seeing that increased spread, which seems to be about not following the, the guidance on preventative measures. So it's not geographically that we have hotspots so much right now as amongst certain certain groups, some of which we would expect. And, and this, uh, this last one is something new for us. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Richardson. Next question for Joanna from the Hamilton Spectator. Joanna, you can go ahead. Hi, thanks so much for taking my question today. Um, Dr. Richardson, my question is um, going back, my questions are going back to the 20 somethings. Um, so do you have an idea of, it, of like, how are they getting it? Like, is it at parties? Is it, at, is it connected to certain post-secondary schools or, or just their living conditions or hanging out at parks? Like, have you been able to, through your contact tracing, get an idea of how they are getting the virus? So it seems to be, it's not a particular school, it's not a particular uh, outbreak, and I'd say they're mostly just post-college age, you know, that kind of late college and, uh, slash university and older age group. Um, and so it seems to be more this piece about through commuting, um, recreational activities, social activities, that they're not keeping the physical distance. You know, even when we talk about groups of five, uh, being allowed up to groups of five, they're not, um, we're still saying people should physically distance within that group. Um, really the, the physical distancing doesn't apply only to, to families who live together. So any other group should be maintaining that physical distance. So 
it is about not physical distancing in those situations if they do go out uh, for a walk or if they're at whatever it is that they may be doing um, and not following those preventive measures of you know wash your hands frequently wash your hands when you come back in uh, make sure that you're covering your your cough make sure that if you're symptomatic to get tested and to self-isolate. So it's more around the behavioral pieces of not doing the preventative measures than it is around any particular setting that they're in. And the second thing I wanted to ask you is, um, can you tell us a bit more about this social media campaign? I mean, if they are not getting the message like now, the messages you've had out there for quite some time, how are you gonna get this message across to them? Isn't that a great question, Joanna? You know, this is absolutely the one that that we have health promotion specialists working on and communications people. Um, and you're right. Like this is this is a message that's been out there. I keep saying we've been in training now. Somebody said to me today, it's not been three months, Elizabeth. It's been four months that we've been working on this issue and talking about the uh, about these key messages, right? And so, you know you'd have to say, how could we not get it by now? I think Paul said that a few times along the way that you're really anticipating that people really should understand where we are at. But we do know that for some people, they may not see that risk for themselves. And we know particularly in young adults that can be the case, or people may be getting fatigued around the risk message that when risks become um, sort of more familiar and the, or they haven't per, uh, personally experienced something that's really bad associated with it. They may have had a friend get sick and it wasn't that bad. You know, people can start to, to, to sort of desensitize to the risks. And so I think we're cognizant that we could be going through a phase of that. And so um, we're gonna, that's exactly what we're doing in terms of looking at how could we reach them? What could we do? How do we help them understand? What are the things under underlying why they might be doing it? And then develop a campaign that the best we can tries to get that message across. Because again, back to what the mayor said earlier, you know, at the end of the day, most of us have people in our lives that are older, that are maybe more frail, that may have a medical illness, and even for any one of us, we, we just don't know for whom this might be a more severe illness, and we certainly don't want to see that happen. Thanks, Dr. Richardson. Next question to Don Mitchell from CHML. Don, you can go ahead. Are you there, Don? Sorry, I didn't unmute my mic. Apologize. Thanks for uh, taking my uh, questions. Uh, first one's for Dr. Richardson. And um, we just had, I just uh, wrote a story this about uh, three retailers that I reached out to, three major retailers in Hamilton uh, that had employees come down with COVID-19. And as we get closer to reopening, is that a concern? They all said they had reached out to public health and were following guidelines. So can you tell me what you think of that? Is that a concern? And you know, what are you telling them? So I'm not certain of which exact retailers you're speaking oh, it to. Was, um, it was Walmart in Ancaster. It was uh, Fresh Co. at Upper Gage. And it was uh, Barton Street Lowe's. Sure. So we've had many, many, um, th you know, we haven't had any workplace outbreaks. We've been very fortunate. As I said, our, our colleagues in the GTA have had workplace-based outbreaks. And, um, and they've been doing a lot of work on those. And we're very fortunate. People have actually been doing really well here in Hamilton. We've said this over and again, over again, that people have been doing a good job following the advice. And when you look at how our essential workers in, in the workplaces that you've been naming are, are very much those that are supporting the community through groceries or critical supplies, um, they are have been doing a great job. And we're not seeing anything beyond uh, single cases um, in any of our workplaces, we don't have any specific outbreaks. So for all of them, you know, we do encourage them. There is, there is now really good guidance that's been developed for all workplaces. The Ministry of Labor is working on these issues as well and encouraging them to follow um, that guidance as they go and, uh, and to monitor and, and make sure nothing more does happen. So, um, you know, there, there's uh, that support in place and we'll keep working with them on those fronts. Okay, and my follow-up question um, is either for uh, Dr. Richardson or it's uh, for Paul Johnson. Um, I just got off a call listening to the uh, Brantford give an update, their medical officer of health, and uh, they just had a whole bunch of migrant workers were Norfolk, Haldeman County, trying a bunch of migrant workers to Brantford. A lot of people in Brantford, the politicians and the medical officer of health, I quote, said, I was not involved in it. 
I was involved and informed after the decision was made and plans were in progress. Um, nothing like that is, has happened in our region, like in Hamilton. And um, what's your thoughts on potentially a, a, a county or a region coming to you and saying, we'd like to house some, um, some people, isolate them for 14 days? So Paul, do you wanna start this one off? Uh, so uh, to date, uh, that, that hasn't been something that's happened here uh, where we've had to decant people. Uh, it has been, uh, as you saw with the Rosslyn, it's been happening within the community. I will say though that uh, we work in a regional environment and we do communicate back and forth uh, uh, with each other. And in the case of large volumes of people, uh, there may always be these, these realities of, of having to look at where uh, folks would go and whether those are alternative health facilities, whether those are in this case hotels or motels, uh, those kinds of conversations. Um, happen at a very high level to say, are we in this together? And the answer is yes. But to date, we've not had to do that. The real uh, drive um, from a health perspective is that local communities have solid plans in place about how they, they, they do that. So I can't speak specifically to how that communication in, in Brantford and Haldeman and Norfolk uh, uh, went, but in, in terms of anybody approaching us, um, uh, no. But uh, in theory, if the situation got, got bad enough, I mean, Hamilton is a center that has more hotels spaces available than, than other communities that surround us and uh, same in Niagara. And so there may be uh, situations where those would happen. So in the theoretical, yes, it could happen in, in, in Hamilton. And um, I'm, I'm not so sure that it would be our case that we would be decanting people to other communities, given the resources that we have with spaces in this community. But recognizing in this neck of the woods between Niagara and Hamilton, uh, we are larger centers. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, possibility. And then I'm going to let uh, Dr. Richardson talk a little bit to the strategy around uh, migrant, farm work, mar migrant farm workers, because that is something uh, that is a shared uh, reality amongst um, all of the, uh, the areas that surround Hamilton. Sure, absolutely, Paul. I mean, my, migrant farm workers, we have known from the beginning of COVID that this was an area where we would have ongoing you know, immigration into our community uh, with these very essential workers. I mean, this is very much a workforce that supports our food supply, our ongoing food supply, and uh, we need them and uh, they need us for their jobs, we know. And uh, so we have to figure something out. And that's why the feds put in place, the federal government put in place, you know, protocols in terms of what the expectations were when people uh, uh, were arriving for work in terms of isolating for 14 days has been the case for all travelers uh, before they start work and then um, making sure that there were appropriate measures in place. So there's been good guidelines that have been developed. Um, all of us within public health have, are quite concerned and and uh, tuned into these issues. And so our colleagues, whether it's down Haldeman Norfolk way or down Windsor Essex way, um, they have been involved in, we're always involved in inspecting migrant farm worker housing um, and looking at the inf infection prevention and control measures um, in these groups. So um, we're certainly paying a lot of attention to it here in Hamilton. We've, we have reach out to say to our, our, uh, our colleagues across the province, you know, and, and our ones locally here in, in Haldeman Norfolk, when we hear what's going on, are there supports we can provide? We're all strapped in public health, but we all know that we have to work hard at, at preventing uh, any further spread. And, and so we're here to support each other and help us get the job done. And so, um, you know, it's unfortunately the case that that both in Haldeman Norfolk as well as down Windsor Way, they have had cases amongst that group. Their their housing is very tight. It's very in terms of the number of people who are together, and so they're following through on the plans of what to do if uh, if COVID nineteen gets into that community. But it is unfortunately uh, a situation where it's easier to spread and. Um, and so, you know, continue to watch this, monitor it closely, and uh, we're doing very much that here in Hamilton by inspecting them regularly and and uh, checking in with them regularly. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Richardson. Mr. Mayor, that's the end of our media questions for today, so I'll pass it back to you for some closing remarks. Okay, I'm, I'm tired of answering them, quite frankly, so thank you. Uh, just just uh, to uh, have them, uh, and, and I, I meant that on a personal level as a joke, not funny. Uh, McLean's Media, thank you for uh, continuing to help us uh, make these broadcasts run smoothly and to uh, George, Rosalie Visitors and Georgia Whalen, our American Sign Language interpreters. And of course, Cable 14 and Bill Custers and the entire team, uh, we couldn't do any of this without you. 
And of course, again, our essential workers out there that have been mentioned a few times uh, today, uh, the folks that are out there in the grocery stores and uh, pharmacies, Costco's, or, uh, Freshco's, or all those great stores that uh, we all get our supplies at, uh, all of them physical distancing and being protective of one another and of their customers and still being able to supply us with uh, the things that keeps, keep us going on a day-to-day -day basis in, in, in our entire city. So thank you to all of them. And uh, Eureka, today is National Donut Day. Uh, for Hamilton, that should be a uh, resounding celebration being the, uh, the home of Tim Hortons Donuts, the first ever donut shop. Uh, uh, Tim Hortons was on Ottawa Street, as uh, most Hamiltonians know, but uh, certainly a national, a national treasure. And, uh, and we have, I think, more donut, Tim Hortons donut shops per capita than any other municipality in North America, as I understand it. But there are other great donut shops that you can go to. Darling Donuts in Burlington, or Donut Monster on Lock Street, or Granddad's Donuts on uh, Burlington Street, uh, at, uh, at James. Uh, all of them have uh, excellent donuts and excellent apple fritters. So if you want to celebrate National Donut Day, there are some places where you can do that. Beyond that, it uh, looks like the weather is going to be fantastic uh, over the weekend, hopefully. Hope you enjoy your weekend and we will see you uh, next week with uh, an additional media update, giving you some of the latest updates on the news that's uh, happening, not only federally, provincially, but locally. Thank you all very much. Have a great weekend.